Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Eastern Border. Today we have, um, well, a bit of complicated news, a bit of interesting news, but first I'd like to, um, like to speak about Mariupol, because recently one of my news channels, and only one, posted that Mariupol has fallen and that the Russians have hoisted their own flag on top of the administration building. This was also retweeted by Martyr Maid, who apparently also watches the counterintelligence theme tweets. However, I haven't yet heard any major Russian news outlets, and I'm not even looking at Ukrainian ones, I'm looking at the Russian ones, who would confirm this information. Besides, well, I highly doubt that... Um, I highly doubt that there actually is an administration building left standing in Mariupol upon whom such a, such a flag could be hoisted. So, you know, this is, this is probably, this is probably some, some fighting for some city districts. Mariupol has been surrounded and Zelensky states that without some aid in tanks and airplanes, it won't be easy to break the siege. But it, the city is basically leveled, so I don't know what this is, what, what's going on here. The thing is that um, Mariupol serves as a kind of a one of the routes where, where if Russia actually breaks through and then moves onward, then they could cut off and and circle all the Donetsk, Lugansk uh, Ukrainian soldiers, which would be bad. But I still want to have more confirmation about this actually happening. But there are such rumors. I just don't know how the situation could have drastically changed from yesterday. But, but so maybe this is this info, but it doesn't seem to be that valid at, at this point in time. At the same time, Russian Roskompozor, or Russian Roskomnadzor, Roskompozor is the common term used for used for this in in Russian media. Have now declared Alexander Nevzorov, one of my journalism mentors. As, um, as an extremist and blocked its site. However, I still follow him on Telegram and as Nevzorov is in Israel right now, yeah, I highly doubt that um, anyone will really, you know, take him down that much. And I, would l I mention him currently because he posted a really kind of funny comment about the situation there since the Ukrainian army, their chief intelligence, declared that the Russian Federation Army tries to restore their losses by by accounting by, by taking uh, taking the reserves, you know, the, the mothballed tanks back in order, you know, the older tanks from late Soviet era and stuff. However, the situation with the tanks is really really awful because basically the optics and electronics that were inside these tanks for aiming and, and various measurement devices and everything that contained some uh, rare, earth, rare earth metals and other valuables, yeah, that has been stolen completely, looted. And apparently in the 4th Tank Division of Russian Federation, they found out that out of the 10 unmothballed, you know, tanks that were put back in order, only one was... Um, was, was found to be in working order, and we've heard reports about I, one of these commanders, actually, you know, who, were, who was responsible for the mothballing, shooting himself because, well, everything's been stolen. And, um, yeah, I believe that everything's been stolen, but these news, these news, um, well, smelled weird to me. So, I'm a quote Nevzorov on this, <clears throat> quote, no, well, this is a clear fake. Where could they have taken this this one tank that wasn't completely looted? Out of where? Martians gave it to them. In this this so-called mothballing, there cannot be any working tanks. Everything's been looted. Basically, the easily removable and 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 just and just as easily breakable parts with um, with valuables in these tanks basically basically costs. Uh, starting from 300,000 to 3 million rubles. Between the soldiers and officers of Russian Federation, there are no idiots. They excellently know how much, how much each part of the tanks that have been entrusted to, to, to them is, is basically costing. So that's an important thing, since uh, really, if, if you had been listening to my show, you know that all this country is based on corruption, not, not vice versa, but like I mentioned yesterday, I simply couldn't imagine the levels of corruption. But about the battlefield losses, once again we come to the mobilization efforts. I received a voicemail today that warned me about this. 
Yesterday, my best enemy, Igor Girkin, spoke about this on an interview for a Russian opposition channel. Th the, the part of Russian opposition that hates Putin for him being too peaceful and not warmong warmongering enough. Just a reminder, those people exist, so I, I, take, the, I take info from those kind of people. And um, what happened was that he stated that without mobilization, Russia will lose this war. And there, uh, there have been claims about the fact that Putin might, might do this. For one, Ukrainian news, news uh, posted an image of a 25th of, of March, kind of a, a letter sent to the, sent to the kind of uh, these, these places where the conscripts are about to go, you know, uh, the, the mobilization centers. And this letter claims that they have to report by April 11th the number of conscripts which which are would probably be available for deployment to this so-called special operation. Uh, the letter also states that this is uh, the fulfilled the decision of the chief of the general staff to deploy these new conscripts that will be called in in spring to the special operation in order to <clears throat> maintain the combat readiness and maintain basically pack up the losses. So the standard draft just won't work here. And I've heard a lot of news about how together with the draft, we might actually see, we might actually see that, um, that mobilization pops up, which would be pretty terrible since, well, again, mobilization is considered to be political suicide for Putin. However, well, Maybe, maybe, you know, uh, if he's pushed and he's gathering everything that's happening, maybe he has no other choice. And this seems very realistic since, well, he has to figure out how to win somehow. From other news, Shoigu has still not been seen anywhere and uh, the one video where he appeared seems to be recorded. Meanwhile, his deputy, one Yevkurov, is going around to Russian hospitals and um, we got a video, which I posted on Twitter about an hour ago, where he stated that he was, he was giving an award to a Russian defrator, that's kind of like a step between the soldier and, and a sergeant, uh, basically who had lost a leg. He, vis he visited the soldier and he wished him, get healthy and get back on your feet. Or in Russian, Vizdorovich i vstać na nogi. And this kind of, this was, was tweeted by Maxim Kotz and I retweeted this and this kind of shows this attitude. I mean, well, there is no too soon levels or there, there is no kind of empathy to these people and this is quite crazy. At the same time, Russia apparently has again attacked nuclear research reactor in Kharkiv and uh, my sources report that it's currently impossible to estimate the extent of damage but the reactor has been attacked. And, and once again, by the way, this, this made me think about, about their own violence and their own actions and the whole denazifying thing since... Well, in Moscow, a protester was arrested and um, fined 50,000 rubles for what, um, what was, you know, what the prosecutors say were discrediting the Russian army. Now, the thing is, she was holding a poster with a Russian anti-fascist slogan, Fascism ni prajot, or Fascism won't go through. Basically, we won't stand for fascism. And this made me think that, you know, I can kind of believe Nevzorov. I mean, the Russian cops must be really smart. They, um, they know who the real Nazis here are, and uh, that makes me wonder, how is the denazification going? At the same time, again, another picture was that um, in Novosibirsk, on a really old trolley bus, whose, de whose door, from the Soviet era even, whose doors were fixed with wooden planks, they still plastered the the Z, their modern-day neo, neo swastika, on the window. And there is this nice comment that um, that Russian imperial ambitions meet reality on the Stralabus doors. Doors are broken, so get fixed with planks. But money for new ones is long stolen, and more will never come. But the neo, neo swastika, the Z, that has been, you know, designed in American Photoshop and printed using a Japanese printer, using an American-built computer, on European piece of, of, of ticket of, of paper, yeah, they, they take great pride in this. Which is just just kind of crazy. And and how do you how do you respond to this? Well, Ukrainians have also created interesting anti-tobacco warnings since we have to have them on the packages. And um, this one states, "Kidai palici pomresh i ne pobacish jak zdochne Putin," 
or basically it says quit smoking you'll you'll expire or die and you won't even notice you won't be able to see how how putin dies well zdochnić is is um, a term used to describe how uh, animals expire and, and fall down and everything so that's a bit of a thing and uh, finally yesterday i was watching a three-hour stream of navalny's team you know the liberal russian opposition activist whose team has basically all moved abroad and have been declared extremists and i don't know maybe some of them live in lithuania now some of them live in poland all over the place and um and it made me think since well they kind of blame themselves for this crisis in the sense that they hadn't pushed the west to do more before this and and recently you know i've been you know saying some not so pleasant things about the united states but i'm definitely not among the people who blame the united states for all this situation and and here's my response to everyone who is still claiming that oh no united states provoked russia no 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 i believe it's the vice it's the other way around the Navalny's team yesterday stated that this could have been prevented if Russia had, sorry, if the United States had listened to Navalny's team earlier and faster and put the sanctions, these brutal sanctions on the oligarchs with their stolen money just before this happened in 2014, 2015 even, during all these times when when uh, Skripal was, was poisoned by Navichok, you know, and, and not like any, not, not like people didn't know that all this London Square, like uh, Moscow Grad, as as I think, no London Grad, sorry, how it's called, you know, not not like anyone didn't know that it had all these all this oligarch money. You know, they they claim that what Russia, what United States and Europe can take responsibility of is the fact that they should have put harsher sanctions on oligarchs previously, and that would lead to a better odds of a, a new palace coup, maybe. Now, I'm not exactly 100% sure, but I believe that, yes, those preventive sanctions could have done something, like at least. Then again, I, I then, then again, if you think about it, it might have prevented the war, but I think Putin would just prepare for it a bit better, maybe. I don't know. But that's, that's one of the things that uh, they say there, where, about which the United States could take responsibility for. Another thing is that, um, yeah, apparently... Apparently, Politico just now posted what we mentioned here yesterday about the about the Russian troops killing one of their own commanders. So at least that's good professionalism from me if I'm faster than Politico. So that's nice. But finally, to all these arguers and everything that still claim that Ukraine is just you know they had been bombing Donetsk for eight years and everything. Well, if we believe the Russian propaganda, which I clearly don't, but if we believe them, then turns out that Ukraine has bombed Donetsk for eight years, using bioweapons, no less. And, and they've been doing this with the help of the West and the United States of America. So, you know, if any of this were true, and if we look at how competent the Ukrainian soldiers and, and everyone has been, then if this were in any way true, even just partially true, right, then... Donetsk would be just a wasteland, a desert. Nothing would have remained from Donetsk. Then I have to state that um, if 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 Ukrainian if if Ukrainians actually bombed they bombed it, then they did the the biggest biggest blunder in history because they were just like slacking off. And and if you look at the data of of how many people f were were like dying in these border skirmishes over there. It was like, what, it was 21 or something, 22 in the whole year of 2021. And there was fire from Donbass side as well. So I wouldn't, wouldn't count on it. But here's some, some arguments that you can use to explain the situation to people. Again, the front's calcifying, but I'm looking for more updates. I really want to find out what's going on with the Mariupol situation here. But, um, well, we'll get to all this soon. So that's it for today. До свидания, товарищи. Happiness is mandatory. Information is ammunition. And if you can, please support the show on Twi on the Eastern Border LV. Click the donate button there, or become our patron at patreoncom border. Thank you to the patrons who are supporting the show. I really hope to get back to normal programming one day, and support Ukraine. Stand with Ukraine. Don't fall for this information, and donate to Ukrainian charities. I thank you immensely. До свидания, товарищи.